That's the same problem if you buy a list. That's probably even worse. You know, how many people have gone through those contacts and just sort of burned the list before you got your hands on it? Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy from the Quick Mail Tayo. Hey, and this is Jack from emailsthatsell.com. Before we jump into the rapid fire, I want to tell you something pretty important. Jack and I received a lot of questions and know that there is a lot of problems around deliverability. So we kind of like wondered, what can we be doing? Jeremy and I actually sat down, looked at a bunch of cold email data and built a course that shows you exactly how to set everything up in cold email so that prospects actually get your email in their inbox instead of the junk folder. That's right. So if you got like less than 60% open rate, that definitely is something you may want to check out. And cherry on the cake for our listeners. Since you're a show listener, Jeremy and I are hooking you up with free access to this course. So there's really no reason why you should struggle with deliverability uh, now or any time in the future, because we're going to be keeping the course updated. You get lifetime access. It's all good stuff. So how do you get the course? How do you get your hands on the material, all the training videos, all that? It's very simple. Your coupon code is PODCAST2019. One word, all caps, that's it. And where's the course? Just go to quickmail.io slash course, and you'll see the link there. Make it really easy. Click the button. And remember, PODCAST2019 is your coupon code that's going to give it to you for free. Yeah, and uh, go get it right now because we don't really know how long we're going to leave that uh, free coupon around. There is some limitation about how long we can keep it alive. So go get it right now. And the only thing we ask in exchange, if you really like the course and it helps you, just leave us a review. I mean, that'd be, that'd be nice. If you're thinking of leaving a two-star reviews, I can point you to other courses. That's fine. <laughs> and uh, just don't do it on one. Anyway, go benefit from it. Go grab it. And uh, let's go back to the show. Yep, that's right. We got a rapid fire episode coming at you. We're going to talk about a couple questions that came in through podcast listeners. And if you've got a question yourself, send us an email at podcast at quickmail.io and we'll throw it in in a later episode. We'll answer it for you. All right, Jeremy, you ready to kick things off? Yeah, let's do it. Number one, how big of a risk are you putting yourself at if you don't use a cold email domain? And what's the worst case scenario? I think, Jack, you can take this one because you got a little story of one of your clients. Yeah, so I think I've seen the worst case scenario. And that was a client of mine had been sending cold email for a while using their own company domain. And one day he found out that he couldn't send an email that would reach his co-founder's inbox. It was going straight to spam. Clients weren't hearing back from him. And that was kind of a nightmare which all could have been avoided if you get yourself a cold email domain. That's probably worst case. Before we move on, is there anything somebody can do if they've hit this point and they're listening to this episode? Well, the first thing they have to do is to stop any cold outreach on this domain. That's really the first thing. Leave it rest for 24 hours. And then if this was like a one-off, there is a chance that after 24 hours, you'll be in good shape. But otherwise, what I'll do is I'll start emailing all my friends and tell them, hey, my email may have been in junk folder. If it is the case, please mark this email and not spam and start you know, emailing normally and don't do cold email on this domain again. It's a little bit out of your control, which is the frustrating part. It's not like an exact recovery checklist, so to speak, once you've been um, struggling to inbox. But OK, fair enough. That's probably worst case. Uh, question number two is almost a follow-up, but from a, a different listener. They asked, does it always make sense to use a cold email domain? The answer is yes and no. And the reason why it's not a clear cut is a risk factor. How comfortable are you with the risk? It's a bit like asking someone who is driving, you know, do I have to put my seatbelt? No, you don't, right? But in case of a crash, you wish you had. And it's exactly the same thing. People say, hey, but you know, those companies are sending millions of emails, legit emails. 
you know, maybe like a 200 emails campaign or call email won't do any harm. They are probably right, but it's a bit like saying, hey, it's only five minutes to the next um, gas station. What are the chances of me getting you know, into an accident. It's exactly the same thing. It's a risk assessment. It's on you guys, but I would say, you know, I prefer to wear a seatbelt. That was well said, Jeremy. Personally, the way I think this through is if I'm confident that nobody could ever possibly dream of hitting the flag of spam button, if I reach out to them, then I'll go ahead and use my actual inbox. If it's for a really small number, I'm talking about fewer than a dozen. If you've got something pushy or anything that can possibly annoy somebody, definitely don't send it from your company domain. But then again, why are you sending an email that might annoy somebody in the first place, right? If you know the email you're sending are so good that people will kill for it, then it's probably a safe bet to send it from your email, even if it's a cool email. Personal example, I've used my own work email in order to invite people on our podcast, just because the chances of somebody getting annoyed at that message is so small and willing to risk it. And it's also a whole lot easier than to set up an automated outbound campaign if you just need one or two emails. At the same time, if you're inviting people to your podcast, it's not really cool because everyone knows your podcast, right? Yeah. And if that's not the case, it's probably because your listener haven't put a review on. So <laughs> if you're listening to the show and really love our show, please add a review. Yeah, that's true. It's like... Uh, don't make me beg. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, podcast reviews are like, uh, I don't know, if we were pandas and they were, the reviews are eucalyptus leaves. We just sort of <laughs> have to have them to keep it going. We got another question here. It goes, hey, my prospect bounced on the third email I sent. What happened? Jeremy, let me start with this one because I actually saw the, the screenshots of the email thread. So first of all, if a prospect bounced, what does that mean? It just means that the email wasn't valid, that there was no connection to the inbox, right, Jeremy? No, you can actually bounce for a lot of different reasons. The classic one, obviously, if I send an email to, I don't know, I'm a superstar at hikingboots.com, maybe that domain doesn't exist, and therefore, of course, you know, it will bounce. But it will also bounce if the domain receiving the email thinks that it's a spam, for example, and then we'll bounce and say, sorry, we won't deliver your email because we think it's spam. And they will return a different return code. And when the bounce come back uh, to you, then usually this return code is shared with you. It's something like 5.1.0, something like that. This is a non-existing you know, user. Every server got their own sort of code. It's normalized, but at the same time, when it comes to rejected because of spam, not everyone is using always the same code. So there's plenty of code, some of them like uh, invalid content, and maybe they will use invalid content instead of just saying rejected for spam. Those sort of things happen. Okay, so if that happens, is it safe to assume that we've been put on a spam list or that our reputation has fallen so that it's not letting our message get delivered? So that's a great point. Maybe your first email goes through, your second email goes through, but between the second and the third, maybe your domain reputation drops so low that people think that you're sending spam on a third email. Or it could simply be that maybe you've been contacting the same company with too many emails, and therefore the company thinks like, okay, well, let me block this guy. It's probably like sending spam. Or it could be that the recipient already flagged your two first emails as spam, and then the third one is getting bounced in your face. But again, it will depend on what server, what company. It's not the same rules on Gmail. It's not the same rules on Outlook. Those sort of things matter. All right. Yeah, that's a great answer. Way more detailed. Uh, the only thing I was coming up with was it's possible that uh, the person may have closed their account or changed jobs, you know, so that the... Yeah, that's also possible. You could also have email boxes full. But in this case, you know, usually, you know, <laughs> what are the chances they are going to read their email? And one more thing, if you're getting bounced on a third email, don't send a fourth one just to test. That's the chances of you going through on the fourth one are like close to none. Okay, let's move it along. Next question. Is there a best source for getting leads? Hunter.io, Lead Kahuna, et cetera. Uh, why don't I jump on this one first? Yeah, that's in your alley. To me, the best source for leads is by finding the companies probably first and then the people at those companies yourself and then turning the names and domains into valid email addresses. That's the best 
source for getting emails in my book because you can be very hands-on and detailed with every step of the list building process. Whereas if you maybe were leaning on a database to just source your leads for you, you're hoping their data is fresh. You're hoping that um, you know they're going to have the information you need about each prospect or company in order to get the leads you want. But me, I like to own every step of the lead, every step of the list building process. What about you, Jeremy? What's your take? Or you could just pass. Yeah, here we are a really big fan of actually building your own list. And in a case of you know grabbing things from databases, it could be that you know they're getting hammered you know, right and left by the same people doing the same searches. Yeah. Like, I don't know, CEO of whatever kind of type of company between X and X. Yeah. There is usually millions of data on those databases. So freshness is obviously a question, but usually that's always the same data that gets hit. So people do the same searches. Yeah, that's the same problem if you buy a list. That's probably even worse. You know, how many people have gone through those contacts and like Jeremy said, just sort of burn the list before you got your hands on it. All right, I think we covered that one quite well. Next question says, if you have both the CEO's company email and personal email, which one would you email? That's a good one. I got my answer. What's yours, uh, Jack? Yeah, so in my notes, um, I want to know what you have to say, because if you're inviting that CEO to join you and a mutual friend for a round of golf, I'd say sending to the personal is okay. But for everything else, I'd keep it business because I know in some of the teardowns we've done and just personal experience, if somebody reaches out to my personal email that's sort of reserved for, I don't know, friends and not work stuff, it's a little bit annoying. So I instantly ding points if they're talking work on sort of my private line, if you will. I have exactly the same remark about context. You know, obviously it depends on the context, but at the same time, I'm wondering, do you think that if someone receives an email on their personal inbox, they will pay more attention to it? Oh yeah, absolutely. But the problem is I'm going to open that email with a little bit more angst and therefore it's going to be that much tougher to get a positive reply from me. Yeah. And for me, when I receive things on my personal inbox, I have you know, almost virtually no obligation to follow up. I'm only following up on things that I receive at work. Yeah. And everything else, I just let it slide. So, okay, I have to clarify here. Does that mean you feel an obligation to, f- to respond to cold email? Well, no, but at least I do something with the email, like putting them into my swap folder. Yeah. <laughs> for cold a- email. <laughs> it gets acted on at some point. Okay, that's true. Moving on? Yeah. Can you guys talk a bit about unsubscribe messages? Should you have just a link or just a line of text, no link? I know in a teardown that you mentioned a generic one is bad. All right, let me start briefly because I know this is your area of expertise, Jeremy. But for me, there's two ways you need to think about unsubscribes. One is the legal and the other is the human. Legally speaking, you need an unsubscribe, at least if you're sending messages in America. But the Can Spam Act is quite vague when it comes to letting your list know they can opt out. In fact, it's so vague, you could go as far as to say, just let me know if you want to opt out and I'll make sure you don't hear from me again. That technically, and I'm not a lawyer, but technically that should be good to cover you from a legal standpoint. The other, like I said, is human. Personally, I don't want to read an unsubscribe message that sounds like it was added because I'm on a mass market campaign. Instead, if somebody's reaching out one-to-one, I think that opt-out should look one-to-one. It should sound like this person wrote it for me as sort of a a PS or even an afterthought. Hey, by the way, you know, if you're not interested, let me know. Make sure you don't, you know, we don't clog up your inbox again. Something like that is best for the human side of the opt-out. I mean, you're absolutely spot on, Jack. There's not much to add. I will add probably like two more points. The first one is there's nothing like you say in legislation that says it has to be super formal. It could add some humor to it. Depending on your message, I don't know, like, hey, and if you don't like dolphins like me, click on this link. Obviously, it's a very bad one, but that's the idea. Okay. So you can still be playful with it. The second point is from a legal standpoint, I'm not even sure if you can add unsubscribe in the header because now that's the thing that also appeared is like you can actually put the unsubscribe link in the header directly. It's not a guarantee that it will be displayed because if Google don't think that you're honoring 
this unsubscribe, then they will not display it anymore. And this is for reason to prevent scammers to actually collect people who click on their emails and act on their emails. I mean, that's a whole different can of worm I don't really want to explore right now. And the last thing is be mindful about legislation keep changing. Like I think in California now they're passing a law about cold email that is even harsher, although it's nowhere near GDPR. Interesting. Well, maybe that's a future cast. Absolutely. All right, let's keep it rolling. A couple more here. I've been following all the advice from the podcast regarding email setup, but for some reason, my open rates have fallen below 10% in the last two weeks. After testing for deliverability with a few tools, it seems getting listed on Spam Assassin is the reason. Whom should I contact or hire to get out of Spam Assassin? (laughs) (laughs) Please, Jeremy, show us the light. Oh, gosh, that's, I mean, yeah. It's a bit like trying to contact a cop and asking them to drop your fine. Good luck with that, right? You've been caught. That's it. (laughs) Now you need to do some jail time. That's it. Okay, so the way I see this, and from my understanding, the IP slash domain is on Spam Assassin. Do I have that right? Almost. I mean, Spam Assassin is a way to assess if your email is spam or not. And it will use a lot of formulas and external data in order to figure out this is a spam or not. So it's too vague to really know what part of it is really the problem here. Now, how do you know it's spam assassin? You know, have you tried like maybe with mail tester, maybe they tell you that one part is, maybe it's because your image text to text ratio is too big, you know, those sort of things. It's difficult to know what part exactly unless we get more details. But what if we were looking for a quick fix here? Could they just buy a new cold email domain, reset everything back up, and in 30 days, they're up and rolling with a, a new campaign out of Spam Assassin? Absolutely, and I think that would work, but it's a bit like bringing the bazooka when there is just a fly. Okay, maybe a bit bigger than a fly, let's say a cat. But there may be different ways of assessing what part of my email spam assassin didn't really like was it you know the domain name or maybe if you're using bitly links in your emails then chances are that you're going to be caught by spam filter as well that doesn't mean that i need to change my whole domain address so there are some basic fundamental mistakes that could be made that would make spam assassin you know scream at you but you need to figure out which part so my advice at this stage will be Try to send an email with Mail Tester and then see if there is anything particular that Mail Tester is pointing you toward. It will tell you what part is actually causing problems. All right, final question here. This one has to do with getting cute in your email copy. I'll just read it so you understand what the heck I'm talking about here. And by the way, I've changed the first name because the name is uh, very prominent in this question. Changed it just to protect the identity if that's... uh, helpful for our listener. So it says, my last name is Chase. So I wanted to get your opinion if using that in a cold email would be memorable in a positive way or cheesy. For example, I know you are a busy VP of sales, so I'm cutting to the Michael Chase for sending you this email. I think it's just about being cheeky in your email copy. You know, should you get cute and put some puns in there or keep it uh, strictly business, I guess? Right off the bat, I'd be lying if I told you I knew exactly what would outperform the other. Some markets, you may have a better response if you throw in some humor. It it could very much be the case. So here's what I would do. You want to test this theory? I think it's a fabulous A-B test. Why not vary your email copy? That's always a good thing. So here's what I do. Take 100 prospects, split it in 50-50. Yes, You marketers out there, I know it's not a big enough number for statistical significance, but it'll at least point you in the right direction, hopefully, at least give you some data that tells you to keep doing it or to stop immediately. Yeah, one more thing I would say is that if you're adding humor and people reply like jackass, then that's okay, I guess. What do you mean? That it's an indication that you should stop? Well, that's probably not someone I would want as a client on a personal level, if Ah, that's true. You know, I'm the type of guy who has humor. So maybe it's a filter for your business. Yeah. All right. So that's the teardown. We've covered quite a variety of topics here from unsubscribes, spam, a lot of spam list uh, questions lately. But 
call to action for you listeners. If you have a specific cold email question you want Jeremy and I to tackle, send us an email at podcast at quickmail.io and we'll answer it live on the show as long as it's not crazy. That's right. And we may even take one or two crazy questions actually. Awesome. All right, Jeremy, great teardown episode today. Great guys. Thanks, Jack. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Or Stitcher or TuneIn. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks. 